Well, good evening and uh, welcome to our service here tonight at the Tron Church. You're very welcome indeed. It's great to have you with us as we together call the name of the Lord, praise him, listen to his word and encourage each other to follow Jesus. So you're very welcome indeed. We're going to begin our time by singing our first hymn, which is on the screens. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise. Let's sing together, shall we? Let's pray, shall we? Our Father God in heaven, we rejoice to sing together, to sing of our great Redeemer's praise, to sing of Jesus, the name that calms our fears, 
the one who bids our sorrows cease because in him and in him alone we find life and health and peace. In him and in listening to his voice, new life is ours. Broken hearts are able to rejoice again. So please, Father, help each one of us as we gather here this evening, as we sing praise to you, as we sit under the authority of your word, as we gather around the Lord's table later on. Please help us to see again with ever greater clarity and certainty the great hope of the unchanging gospel. Would you move our minds and our hearts and our wills to respond with joy and glad obedience, with the obedience of faith, and assist us to proclaim and spread through all the earth the honors of your name. So please help us tonight, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, can I uh, warmly welcome you all tonight, and uh, particularly uh, if you're visiting with us this evening, uh, you're very welcome indeed. It's great to have you with us tonight. You were here, if you were here this morning, you would have received one of the uh, notice sheets, but just one or two things to flag up uh, by way of notice for the week ahead. Our small groups are on this week. They mostly meet on Wednesday evening, but also at various other points during the week. So if you want to find out more about those, have a look at the notices, and you'll see all the different times and places that our small groups are meeting. But if you're not sure or, not, or haven't been along before, then please do come and speak to me or someone else, and we'll happily point you in the right direction. And also, our student work, Release the Word, is well underway. So if you're a student or a young worker, then you're very welcome to come along on Thursday evening at Bar Street, 6.45, and there'll be a nice meal to enjoy, and you'll split off for, for Bible study. So do come on Thursday evening if you're a student or a young worker. You'd be really welcome indeed. But uh, do please take these away. It contains all the notices you need, so please do have a look at that a bit later. Well, we're going to turn now to God's Word and to the letter of Romans. So please do turn it up in your Bibles. And you'll find that if you have a visitor Bible on page uh, 939, 939. We're looking at the first few verses. We're going to read verses 1 to 7 of chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and reading from verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God, and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. May the Lord bless to us his word this evening. Well, let's sing again, shall we? And the hymn is on the screens. See, he dies as a lowly man of sorrows on him laid all our many griefs and woes, our sin, he bore it all, the wrath, the hell, and he has triumphed over all our foes. Let's sing together.
when the uh, offering for the Lord's work will be received. And uh, as the baskets come around, uh, the musicians will play for us. And perhaps take that time to look over these opening words of Romans chapter 1, which we'll be thinking about a little bit later. But so the offering will now be received. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, as we have come to your word in just a few moments, would you please grant us grace, almighty God, to understand your holy word with meekness, all its truth received, and by its light forever live. Please help us to that end, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before Willie comes to open up God's word, we sing our next hymn on the screen. Lord, you are rich beyond all splendor, yet for love's sake became so poor. Let's sing together.
Well, do turn up uh, Romans chapter 1, uh, page 939, I think, if you have one of the church visitors' Bibles. In these three uh, Sunday evenings, at the beginning of term, we're thinking about a very basic question, the gospel of God. What is it really all about? What is the story all about? If you're browsing through a book that uh, you might want to read, maybe you want to take it on holiday or read it, I don't know, at, uh, at night to try and take your mind off things and get you off to sleep. I guess pr probably before you buy it, you want to know a little bit about what it's about. So you'll, you'll read the fly leaf. It'll tell you a summary, won't it? Or at least it'll, it'll give some uh, clues as to the, the content, perhaps a sense of the big story. It'll tell you if you think it's a sort of book that uh, you actually want to spend money on and get into and start reading. Sometimes, I suppose, uh, just knowing who the author is will be enough, won't it? Um, Jane Austen, I suppose, does it for some people. Um, that would definitely be a cure for insomnia for me. But, um, uh, but if I was uh, looking for, for example, a, a Daniel Silva spy novel, now that's a different matter. Um, a deck chair in the sun and one of those in my hand, and I'm a very happy person. But the first time, actually, somebody gave me one of those books, I'd never heard of the author, I didn't know anything about it. I wanted to find out what the story was about. Would I really be interested in reading this? I read the back, gave a bit of an insight, and I started to read the first chapter. And uh, the first chapter began to tell me who the hero was, what he was like, what it was about. And uh, very quickly, I thought, yeah, this is the sort of book for me. Well, what and who is the story of the Christian gospel really about? What is the, the story that the Bible tells? Um, if you've never really got yourself into the Bible before, if you never really engage with the Christian Bible, you may be quite surprised to even know that it has a story. But the Bible has a great overarching story with a great relentless, wonderfully rich plot line that unfolds all the way through and comes to a great climax. It's a story that uh, really does involve the future of the whole wide world. Really? Yes, absolutely. So what is that gospel story all about then? Well, Paul's letter to the Romans uh, that we're looking at here is a part of the Bible that certainly answers that question very clearly, very powerfully. That's why Romans has always been central. It's always been a very, very important part of scriptures for the Christian church. That's why in Release the Word, in our student and young workers Bible studies, you're studying it this term and next as we do every few years. And uh, if you're new and you haven't yet joined in on Thursdays and Release the Word, it's not too late to do it. And I encourage you to do that. Uh, really important. But in fact, this little paragraph that we're looking at here is like a window into uh, the letter to the Romans. It's a bit like that summary on the flyleaf of a modern, uh, modern book. And it contains within it some of the key things, some of the key themes that will be unfolded throughout uh, the chapters that are to come. So last week we looked at just verses 1 and 2, and they, they tell us so clearly, don't they, that the source of this gospel story is unequivocal. It comes from the Holy Scriptures. Notice the Holy Scriptures, the definite article, not just any old Scriptures. Um, and by the way, I suppose I do have to say these days, if, you, if you've been educated at school in the last 20 years, you don't know what the definite article is. That's the word the, not a, uh, for those of you who are a bit younger. I'm, I'm becoming a grumpy old man, but um, I'm no apologies. Came in today and two people at the door greeted me and said, you're getting a bit old for doing all these services. So I'm feeling a grumpy old man tonight. Anyway. <laughs> You know how to greet me next week. Um, the Holy Scriptures, very important. From God's own prophets, verse 2, his prophets, as a personal pronoun. You really are being educated tonight. The Holy Scriptures from his, God's holy prophets. Not anybody else's, not just random scriptures of random religions. He promised it, God himself, long beforehand, long before the birth of Jesus Christ, who came in fulfillment to all of these scriptures. So right here in the first sentence of Romans, we're being told that this gospel makes an exclusive claim. We can't escape from that. There is one source 
of truth about God. Not many. And that source is the historic scriptures that come from God's own prophets, spoken with exceptional clarity through his own mouthpieces. It's exactly what we're seeing in Hebrews, the beginning of Hebrews. In the past, God spoke in many ways through his prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken by his son. And I want to, to look at verses 3 and 4, which do exactly that. They focus on his son. Who is this all about? Well, it's about his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Concerning his son, who's descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared, was appointed to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm going to come back and just zoom in on these verses in a moment. But first of all, let's just zoom right out because we're trying to think about this whole letter to the Romans and why, in the first place, Paul wrote this whole letter to that church uh, in Rome. What is his great concern? Well, of course, he is an apostle. He's being chosen by God and set apart for the gospel. He is a missionary evangelist. Verse 1 says he's been set apart for the gospel of God. He's under compulsion to proclaim this word. Look at verse uh, 14. He says he's under obligation to preach this gospel to all, to Greeks, to barbarians, to the wise, to the foolish, to everybody all over the world. That is his great concern. And he's straight into it right at the very beginning uh, of this letter. He comes back to it again right at the end of the letter. Remember I said, often the beginning and the end of Paul's letters will tell you his great concern. Actually, come and uh, look with me at the end of the letter. Look at, um, well, not the very last chapter, but chapter 15. See what he says there in chapter 15, verse uh, 16. He's saying that he's a minister to the Gentiles, to the pagan nations, especially in the service of the gospel. So that, look at verse 18. So that Gentile people, non-Jewish people all over the world will come to obedience, the obedience of faith in Jesus Christ that he talks about. And verse 20, look, he's committed, isn't he, to new frontiers for the gospel, to proclaim where Christ has not already been known. And in particular here, in verse 24... He says he wants to go on via Rome to Spain. He's wanting to go to these unevangelized places to preach the gospel. This is a letter all about mission. And not just Paul's mission, it's all about partnership in mission with him. Look at uh, verse 24 there. What does he say? I want to be helped on my journey there by you. Now, what does he mean? Well, when he says, I want to be helped, he's using that word in the same sense as somebody who rattles a tin in front of you. And says, can you help me? He doesn't want you to say, oh yes, bless you. <laughs> he wants your cash, doesn't he? When he rattles his tin in front of you. That's what Paul's asking for here. He's asking for funding. He's saying he needs and he wants their tangible, practical help. Because he needs their, their gospel resources for his gospel labors. And he doesn't show the least bit of embarrassment in He's very forward about the gospel needs. In fact, placing upon them obligations, as he is obligated to preach, they're obligated to help pay for that gospel mission. He needs their money because mission costs money. And Paul assumes that Christian money is for Christian mission before it's for anything else at all. So he wants their money. He wants their prayers. Look at verse 30 very plainly. He tells them to pray for him. Strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, but he also wants their tangible financial support. A gospel partnership for Paul includes real prayer, but also real provision. And that's his appeal, that's his uh, command to them, to share with him in the Lord Jesus Christ, to share with him in the love of the Holy Spirit. He's talking about what real Christian fellowship is, partnership, sharing, communion, that's the word in verse 27, sharing. He's talking about sharing in spiritual blessings in Christ and says that means sharing in material possessions with Christ's people in the service of Christ's gospel mission. That's just very, very basic uh, Christian teaching. Christian fellowship isn't what we do after this service where we have a nice cup of tea and a biscuit and, and some chocolates at the back. That's very pleasant. It's a small part, isn't it, of Christian fellowship, encouraging one another. 
But Christian fellowship, communion, sharing, partnership means tangible, substantial partnership in the service of the gospel. And when you think about it like that, it, it probably means, doesn't it, that for some Christians, their fellowship is much less substantial than it ought to be. And actually, that, that may well be so even here among our own congregation, among some of us. Some of us give to the gospel mission of the church very sacrificially, very generously. But as you saw from the financial update in the notes this morning, we're way behind on our giving for this year. The reason for that is very simple. Because some of us never get around to giving. Some of us never get around to giving properly. Some of us never even get around to giving at all. Even when we've taken vows before God and everybody else in the congregation to give a fitting proportion of our time and our talents and our money for the church's mission in the world. But friends, we need to wake up, don't we? We need to realize what our lack of care and attention to that says about our value of the gospel, about our value of, of Christ himself and our salvation. Paul's very clear here. He's, he's not mincing his words. He's saying that if the church does share his, his concern, his zeal for gospel mission, then they will eagerly desire not only to pray for him, but to partner with him in tangible support. But it's his great concern, it's that concern for mission of the gospel that drives his whole letter. That's why he wrote this letter. Not so that people could spend years and years writing commentaries and PhDs on the letter to the Romans, but to get that church galvanized for gospel mission. And that's why we're studying it. That's why you're studying it and release the word. But come back to, to chapter one. Why? Why must this message this gospel be so dynamically driven to the ends of the earth with all the support of God's people wherever at such great cost to all cultures, to all peoples, not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles, to the wise, to the foolish, to the Jews, to the Greeks, to everybody. Well, because this gospel is the gospel of God and the only gospel of God. It's about a unique subject. And that subject is there in verse 3. The gospel concerns God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. What the gospel brings to us is spelt out in verse 16 of chapter 1. It brings salvation to everyone who believes, Jew and Greek. And that salvation is from what verse 18 begins to talk about there, the wrath of God which is being revealed against all unrighteousness and all ungodliness of human beings. But that salvation comes to us not from, from right living, not from, from self-righteousness, not from what we do. It doesn't come through, through any kind of human religion at all. It comes only through a right relationship with the one who is the unique subject of this gospel, with Jesus Christ our Lord. The whole message of this letter, the whole message of the Bible, is that salvation can be found in one way alone. And that's through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's the heart of what the gospel is about. That's the heart of what this letter of Romans is about. Jesus, the Savior himself, is the unique subject. He is the substance at the very heart of all the good news about God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, comes everything that we need and we desire and we want. I want you just to look briefly with me at just how dominant this term, through Jesus Christ, is, how pervasive it is in Paul's explanation of the gospel. It's right here in chapter 1, verse 5. Look, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace. You see, through Jesus Christ our Lord comes grace. And you also, he says in verse 6, you also are called to belong to Jesus Christ. And verse 7, grace comes to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8, I thank God through Jesus Christ. You see, God's grace comes to us through Jesus, and we respond to God through Jesus. He's the way from God to us, and he's the way from us to God. Turn over to chapter, to chapter 3 and look at the 
famous little section there, chapter 3, verses 20 to 22, the great contrast. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified, will be declared right in God's sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now there is a righteousness from God for all who believe. How? Verse 22, through faith in Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, there is justification. Turn over to chapter 5, verse 1. Being justified by faith, he says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have obtained access by faith. Chapter 5, verse 11, we are reconciled through him and we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21 of chapter 5, we have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's all there in chapter 6. Chapter 6 ends the same way. Chapter 6, verse, uh, verse 23, the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Chapter 7, again, the famous great question in chapter 7, verse 25, who will, who will save me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, says Paul, through Jesus Christ our Lord, I'll be saved. He's speaking there again, isn't he, in the future tense, when at last we'll be truly saved in our bodies on the day of our resurrection. Just as he goes on to speak about all through the next chapter in Romans chapter 8. It begins that way and it ends that way, through Jesus Christ. Verse 1, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus our Lord, and it ends verse 39, so there's no separation from God's love for those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. No condemnation in Christ Jesus, no separation in Christ Jesus. Everything is in and through Jesus Christ our Lord. We could go on, but I'm sure you've got the picture by now. There is salvation, and the gospel is the power of salvation to all who believe through Jesus Christ our Lord, and through none other, only through Jesus Christ our Lord. Not through Buddha, not through Muhammad, not through Krishna, not through the Talmud, not through any, any religion at all, but only through right relationship with Jesus Christ our Lord. And in an exclusive relationship with Christ through faith. Not, not through Jesus and my cooperation, not through Jesus and my learning, not through Jesus and my performance. No, no, no. God's saving grace, God's justifying, forgiving, reconciling grace comes all, wholly, completely through Jesus Christ our Lord and through him alone. In Christ alone, our hope is found. That's the Reformation faith, isn't it? Because that's the biblical faith. That's the gospel faith. But who is this Jesus through whom everything we ever need it will come? Who is this unique son of God? Well, verses 3 and 4, you see, in chapter 1, they tell us two things, don't they, about who Jesus is. First of all, he says he was descended from David according to the flesh. That is, historically, he was a, a descendant of David, the great king of Israel. God promised David that one day a scion of, of his house uh, would reign on his throne forever. You can read of it in, in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7, way back in the Old Testament. You can read uh, in Matthew chapter 1 in the genealogy that begins his gospel. He maps it out, lays it out so clearly, going back through David, indeed right back to Abraham. But Paul actually means more than that here when he says, uh, according to the flesh. He's not just saying that, that naturally speaking, humanly speaking, uh, Jesus was the son of David. When Paul uses that word flesh, very often, in fact, most often, he's speaking about this present age of the world. It's his way of speaking about this, this world that we live in, the world of sin, the world under the curse. He speaks about this age of the flesh in contrast with the new age, the age to come, which very often he talks about is the age of the spirit, the resurrection age, the age of glory. If you read Romans 8, you'll see that all the way through, there's that contrast between the flesh, those who are in the flesh, and the spirit, those who are in the spirit. 
And he's doing the same thing here in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 1. He's saying Jesus was born into the world of the flesh, that is, into this evil age, under the curse. In chapter 8, verse 3, he he says that he was born in the likeness of sinful flesh. That is, he was born just like one of us. He was born in flesh of our flesh. Not as sinful flesh, because he was sinless. Paul's very careful with his language. But he was born in the likeness of sinful flesh, truly human. And for sin. That is, what he's saying is that in order to deal with sin, our sin, in order to rescue his people out of this cursed world under sin's power, he came from outside as God's eternal son. He, he had no need to enter this world under the curse. C.S. Lewis, I think, puts it so wonderfully when he says, he served in our sad regiment as a volunteer. He came to be with us in order to save us. He was, according to the flesh, descended from David. Do you see the second thing that he tells us here in verse 4 too? He, he didn't remain captive in this cursed world. No, he was declared, he was appointed to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. What that means, you see, is that, that Jesus Christ came to be the new Adam, to be the first of a whole new humanity. That's what Paul speaks of later on in Romans chapter 5. It's what he, he speaks about in 1 Corinthians 15. In fact, it's what we've been seeing in Hebrews chapter 1 and 2 as well. He was the first of many brothers and sisters. Because Jesus was everything that the first Adam was not. Where the, the original humanity was, was characterized by disobedience and became utterly unholy. And that led to sin and to death. But Jesus was not just the opposite of Adam. Jesus was much, much more even than the opposite of Adam. Chapter 5, he says this. Because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. But much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness, much more will they reign in life through this one man, Jesus Christ. See, verse, verse 4 here says that Jesus was, was declared, he was appointed the Son of God with power by his resurrection. It doesn't mean that he wasn't the eternal Son of God before that. No, what it means is that the, the phrase Son of God here means the human Son of God. Adam was God's Son. Adam was created as God's Son. But he fell so tragically, he rebelled. But in Jesus, the man at last God has a true human son of God who was obedient to him in every way, who, who triumphed. And he even triumphed over death. Death could not hold him because he was truly holy in his humanity. The spirit of holiness that it speaks of here, the spirit of holiness dwelled in Jesus in full measure, completely. And so through this one man, Jesus Christ our Lord, at last God's whole purpose for creation for humanity is fulfilled. And Jesus is declared the Son of God in power, that is, the human ruler over the world that God made man to be in the beginning, that man was destined to be. You see, the world that we know, the world that we live in is the way it is. It's in such a mess because, because human beings are no longer truly human. We've been dehumanized by sin. We sometimes use that language, don't we? We say, oh, that, that's inhuman. Or, or that behavior is subhuman. But the Bible says we're all subhuman. We're all subhuman. We've been dehumanized, unmanned by our sin. Every single part of our human makeup is tainted by our rebellion against God. That means that we can't not be what we are. And you know that, don't you? I know that. We can't be what we want to be. Never mind what God wants us to be. It's just not true, is it, what, what I heard President Obama say some years ago at one of those memorial services for, I think it was one of those awful school shootings uh, in America. In the memorial service, he said this. 
deep down inside, we're all full of goodness. Well, friends, if that was the case, he wouldn't have been at a service for a school shooting, would he? But that's the belief of our, our Western liberal worldview. If that were true, friends, this world would be very, very different from what it is. We are tainted in every part of our humanity because of sin. Of course, to say that, which is the, the Christian doctrine of, of total depravity, to say that we're totally depraved, that's not to say that we're all as bad as we could be or we would be without the restraining grace of God. Thank God He restrains that evil greatly much of the time. Nor is it to say that there's no good in people, in all people, regardless of their, their faith or their background. Of course there is. Of course there is. And when we see great good and love and kindness in people, that is a reflection of what we're made to be. And it's a reminder that the, the true image of God in humanity has not been totally obliterated. Thank God. Much of God's image does remain in us, to animate us, to, to, to drive us. And that's what we see when we see human kindness at work and human love at work, sometimes on a grand scale. You, you see it, don't you, when there's an outpouring of, of care and help, when there's some awful disaster in the world and people immediately are rallying to try and help. Well, that's the vestiges of the, the goodness of God that's seen in our human nature. But if any of us really seriously think that if we, if we could just get rid of the supposed malign influences in society, whatever they are, sweep them all away, and all of us would sort of naturally grow up into, into perfect goodness and peace and beauty and wholesomeness. If anybody thinks that, oh dear, turn on your television, reread The Lord of the Flies, or just watch a couple of episodes of, um, what do you call it, Big Brother or Love Island. Actually, that's not my recommendation for your TV viewing. I don't know anything about love. I've never, I've never watched it, but I've read about it. So I, I reckon it's not for watching. But it would tell you, wouldn't it? Any of these reality TV things. We do not see what we long to see. But the story of the Bible, you see, is that there is one place where you do see humanity as it's never been seen elsewhere. In all its sheer beauty and its grace and its unspeakable spoil true humanity. You see it here in Matthew, Mark, in Luke, and John. You see it as you read the pages of the Gospels. You see it in the person of God's Holy Son when He walked in our world. Jesus Christ, our Lord. And God has therefore appointed Him publicly in the sight of all the world as His triumphant, holy, human Son at last. And he has done it by raising him from the dead. He's publicly vindicated him in doing that. He's justified him in the eyes of the whole universe. He's reversed the condemnation that was publicly upon him under that sentence of death on the cross. And now he reigns in life as the true human son of God, the true human being. It's exactly what we've seen in, the, in our morning studies in Hebrews. We don't yet see, do we, humanity in glory with everything in nature under his feet, reigning supreme in God's image. But we do see Jesus crowned with glory and honor, showing us the way and showing us the end of the story. Because his triumph wasn't just for himself. He was bringing many brothers to glory. And just as Adam's rebellion, you see, Paul says here, just as his rebellion led to condemnation for all men, so Christ's triumphant obedience much more leads to justification and life for all who are in Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, we have received grace, says Paul here in verse 5. Grace and peace comes to us through him and through him alone because God counts what is his now to be truly ours through what he's done when we're called to belong to Jesus Christ. And Romans 4 verse 25 has this marvelous truth. He tells us that what Jesus did on the cross in the death he died and in his rising to life, he tells us it was for us. He was delivered up for our trespasses. What was our condemnation became his. 
and he was raised for our justification. What was his vindication becomes ours through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is, when we believe in Jesus, when we bow the knee to him, and when we answer God's call personally to belong to him in obedient faith, then our story becomes united forever with the story of Jesus, the Holy Son of God. We're united with him forever in his risen life. And we enter a whole new world. We leave behind that past age of the curse, the age of the flesh. And we're born again into a new age, into the age of the spirit, into the age of eternal life. That's what the gospel teaches us. I know, yes, I've been telling you this morning, haven't I? We're still in these bodies. We're still sinful. We're still mortal. These bodies are going to die, every one of them, unless the Lord comes. And the New Testament doesn't pretend that's not true. It's absolutely honest. It tells us again and again that our full salvation, that our full redemption is still in the future. Paul says it again and again in Romans chapter 8. We're saved in this hope, the hope of resurrection. But the new age has begun through Jesus Christ, who has gone before us. And we are following our great Savior already. And that's why, you see, our life pattern as Christians mirrors the life pattern of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because we're being saved with him and through him. And he once walked this earth according to the flesh. I mean, he did. For him, that was the road, wasn't it? To Calvary. The way of rejection, the way of scorn, the way of pain. But now he's exalted. He's alive bodily according to the spirit of holiness. Well, so also he calls us now to follow him in his earthly path, to take up our cross and to follow him in that way. But it's by the power of his risen life in his spirit who indwells us that gives us the power to do that and to follow him in this world. And it's also wonderfully that same power and that same Holy Spirit who one day also will certainly lead us where he has already gone into that resurrection life and to that glory. Romans 8 verse 11 is a wonderful, wonderful verse. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. All of that is yours and mine through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The only hope for any human being in life and in death is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. But the good news, you see, the story of God, the gospel, it's a story all about that hope. Because it's a story all about Jesus Christ, our Lord, promised beforehand in the prophets and now fulfilled in the coming of our Savior, the Son of God, the only Savior, the life giver forever, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that's why the Apostle Peter was so clear, unambiguous, and certain when he proclaimed that there is no other name under heaven given to man by which we must be saved, but Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that's why we'll see, particularly as we look at it next time, that the Christian gospel demands from you, whoever you are, every one of us, that we must bow the knee to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Descended from David according to the flesh, but appointed to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us this great story. And more than that, Lord, you've invited us into this story forever, that we should be a part of it, and that we should be united to him, our story and his story forever and ever. 
So, Lord, as we come to this table now that reminds us of the great grace and mercy of the past and of that great promise of future hope, would you draw near to us? Burn into our hearts and minds again afresh this glorious gospel and cause us to cry out to you in faith and in trust to lay hold on these great promises that are ours through our Lord Jesus Christ. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Well, as we gather around the Lord's table together then, we're going to sing together our communion hymn in the bread, in the wine. Lord, remember him on the cross long ago, dying for our sin. be seated. <clears throat> and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Beloved, it's right as we come to the Lord's table that we remember that this sacrament is a memorial of the great sacrifice of Christ for the sins of men. 
and therefore that it is a true means of grace for all who believe in him and who come in trust and in faith. It's a bond and pledge of our union with him and, of course, with one another as members of his body. That's what a memorial is in the Bible. It's not so much about us remembering. Of course, it does that. But it's about God asking us to call him to remember, to remember his covenant. And when God remembers, he acts. He visits his people in grace and in mercy, in salvation. Remember when he gave the covenant sign to Noah, the rainbow. And he said, when, when I see the rainbow, I will remember my covenant and not destroy the earth. It's in the same way when Moses was told at the Passover time to tell the people to, to daub the blood and the, the lintels on the doorposts of the house. And God said, I will see the blood and I will pass over and you'll be safe. And you see, in just the same way, the Lord is, is saying to us, keep this feast as a memorial. When we do that, we're proclaiming to God the new covenant in the blood of his son. We're calling him to remember that once and for all great sacrifice that all of these others pointed to and prophesied. We're calling him to be true to his great promise, to bless us and to forgive us. So in a sense, we're reminding God to be just, that he must be faithful and just because he has promised that we are to be justified in his sight through the blood of his son. So that means that we, we come to his table not groveling. We don't come crawling on our knees begging for mercy. We come boldly and gladly. He invites us to sit around his table, to feast with him, and to rejoice, to trust in his word, that we are his and he is ours. It's, the, it's a real communion with our Lord as we come here. We're showing our trust in his great promise to us. He is saying to us again in this bread and in this wine, I will be your God through Jesus Christ, your Lord. And we're saying to him, yes, Lord, and we will be your people. We trust you. We love you. We want you. Help us and guard us and keep us. It's a real response of faith and obedience. And that's why it's necessary that we, we come to the table like this with knowledge, with faith, uh, with repentance, with love, that we, we don't come holding fellowship with evil, that we don't come cherishing pride or, or any sense of, uh, of self-righteousness in our hearts. We come rightly conscious of our sins and sorrow for our sins. But we come gladly and humbly putting our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, hungering for him, thirsting for him, seeking his righteousness. He's asked us, he's commanded us to do exactly that. So it is a table for sinners. But not proud sinners, not haughty sinners. It can't be that. And if you're proud in your heart, if you're coming here looking down on others, exalting yourself, you can't come in that way to the table of the Lord Jesus. It is a table for transgressors, but it's not a table for unrepentant transgressors. But if you come in humble trust, in obedient faith, penitent faith, coming to seek his promising grace, then don't let anybody hinder you. Don't let even your own heart hinder you. Sometimes it's our own heart above all others that condemns us, isn't it? But whenever God, whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. And that's what this table reminds us. He is greater than our hearts. So let no one hinder you. Remember what they said of Jesus. This man receives sinners and eats with them. Yes, he does. Thank God. And he does still. So come. If you come in penitent faith. 
come and feast with him. And as we draw near to the table, let's hear again his words of great grace. Come to me, he says, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle, I'm lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. It's not harsh, it's kind. And my burden, it's not burdensome. It's light. I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. And this above all, the one who comes to me, I will never by any means cast out. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for the righteousness they do not have but seek. For they will be filled. They will be filled. And so we hear the words of the institution of the supper as they're given to us by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. He says, I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me as a memorial. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We proclaim it to one another. We proclaim it to our own hearts. Above all, we proclaim it to God himself. And we say, as you've told us, remember, remember the blood of your son, the broken body for us. And keep us, as you've promised, in your everlasting life. And so we take these simple elements, bread and wine, just as the Lord did. But we set them apart for this wonderful holy use to proclaim the gospel in our midst this evening. And so as we come near to the table, let's draw near to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we we thank you for the wonder of the story of your gospel, which is the story of your son who came to seek and to save the lost. Sinners like us to bring us to repentance and to grant us everlasting life in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that this table points us back to the once and for all death for our sins accomplished forever, complete and finished. Nothing more to add that assures us of your forgiving grace. We thank you, Lord, that it points us forward to the great joyous celebration to come. The great Sabbath celebration we were thinking of this morning that still awaits us in the kingdom of the glory of your Son. How we long for that great day. And yet even now, Lord, this table reminds us that you are the one who has said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Behold, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So, Lord, draw near to us, we pray. That as we eat and drink, may we be responding to you in all of our hearts, in all of our beings, with faith and trust in the glory of your Son and in the gospel of your Son, so that we may know that great assurance of your love that keeps us and guards us until that glorious day. So hear us and draw near to us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. So according to the holy institution and the example and the command of our Lord Jesus, we now do this, who on the same night as he was betrayed, took bread and he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So if the servers would uh, come now and begin uh, to serve you, you'll receive bread and wine on one, a single tray. If you uh, hand it to the person next to you, that'll be easier for you to then take the bread and the wine. Uh, eat the bread as it comes, but hold on to the cups until we've all been served. And then we'll drink together as one as we share the communion that we have in the Lord Jesus. As they remain seated just before we drink, we sing once again the final verse of the hymn. Claim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together. In 
so may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. We'll stand together to conclude as we sing the doxology. Now to him whose power is able to protect our stumbling feet and prepare our souls for glory. Let's say the grace together, shall we? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.